Okay, so the album comes out. Youngest in charge. Number 73 on Billboard. Number 8 on the R&B hip hop chart. Uh, it initially goes gold, right? Allegedly. So the problem is that what I didn't know that I found out the hard way was that Run DMC wasn't very happy and none of the artists were as happy as I might have thought. Um, they were their own record label. They were their own manufacturer and they were their own distribution company. So they probably had three sets of books, if not more. So what happened was in my contract is there were bumps in the royalties for every goal. So when we reached goal, there was a bump. If we reached platinum, there was another bump, which would increase the percentage that I got paid. So theoretically and allegedly, I was at like 480 something from almost the beginning, the first year. And they never passed 500 technically. So they didn't have to give me an increase in my royalties like they paid me my royalties anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they just like, they doubled down on everything. It was kind of disrespectful. But, you know, I just continued on with my career and with my pursuit of getting my bread. Okay. And that album had a few other singles. It had Think About It and I'm the Magnificent, which you already mentioned. Yeah. And I remember another part of our original conversation 20 years ago, you and I talked about how, you know, these days, uh, these albums that come out, they have a whole bunch of different producers, they have a whole bunch of features, this and that. But back then, it wasn't like that. It was like, yo, this is my joint. I want it to be all me. And I want to have one producer do the whole thing. And this is our work of art that the, the two of us have created. Correct. And that's how it was always like that. Like we, there weren't really many collaborations between other artists at that time. Everyone was almost selfish and wanted to prove a point and show that they were the best, you know? And um, I had, you know, I was on some loyalty. Howie T was the one that put me on, gave me the hit tracks and I didn't want to just jump around to different producers. I remember I was on tour one time and um, JD, Jermaine Dupri, he was a DJ for Silk Times Leather. And he gave me a cassette with some beats. And I, I appreciated it, but I kind of looked at him like, I got a producer already. You know what I'm saying? Not thinking to collaborate, not thinking to work with other producers and other people. I was just thinking like, okay, I, I took it. I took the cassette. I, I, I appreciated it. I loved, you know, I always show people respect, you know what I mean? Especially when they're excited about what they're presenting to you. You know, I always had respect. And I got a lot of demos, a lot of different stuff from different artists. I remember I got Bahamadia's uh demo back in the days and I loved it. I listened to it. You know what I'm saying? And um, so I never threw anything away. I always kept it. I always respected people's art. But like I said, when JD gave me the tape, I was like, well, I got Howie T. That was my, you know, feeling. Be at the time. So just grasping the concept of working with other people was like, for what? You know, we got yeah. the chemistry. And what's, what's wild, no, no disrespect to Howie T at all, but JD would become a much bigger producer over time. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. JD has probably sold hundreds of millions of records at this point, right. whereas Howie has sold millions. You know what I'm saying? Oh, correct. So it's like, who would have known at the time, but had you taken JD up on that offer, who knows where your career could have potentially gone? Right. And But you know, it was the culture at the time and me being on profile records. I don't think it was a... a um, production thing. I think it was more of where we were with the culture and being dedicated or loyal to our home teams. You know what I mean? So yeah, shout outs to JD and all that. Great job. Well, although you weren't getting the money you deserve from Profile, you were making money 
and you were getting show money. And I guess you bought two co-op apartments with the money early on? Yeah, when I turned 18 and I was able to do a legal purchase, I uh, did a simultaneous closing on two condo units uh, in this place called King's Village over in all uh, like Old Mill Basin near to Canarsie in Brooklyn, just, you know. But this is the funny part though, the unit I had was, a I, well, I had two units, but I was only gonna live in one. So the unit I was gonna live in, it had a pool view, right? And it was right out the window. I was on the fourth floor and there was a pool right outside there. So after I closed and moved into the building, the pool closed and never opened back up. <laughs> they turned it into a parking lot and a CVS. I was disgusted. I was like, yo, I'm ready to get it on. I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be lit. It turned into like a, a parking lot. I'm like, bro. <laughs> But the units did uh, accrue in value, and I did make some good money off of those units. So, you know, it's good and bad and everything. <laughs> All right. So, 1990, yeah. you put out your sophomore album, Legal, which is a reference to you turning 18. Right. 84 on Billboard, 15 on the R&B hip-hop charts. And the big song on there was The Mission. The Mission, yeah. Yep which samples the Mission Impossible theme song. Yeah, well, you know, we didn't sample it. Actually, Spanador from Cult Jam, he played it over. And I feel, we, me and Howie felt terrible about missing his credit on that, uh, on the label thing. But Spanador came and he worked with Howie too. You know, they were all friends. And um, he came in there and, and played the, the James Bond chords. And um, it came out quite well. But um, the, the truth be told, that wasn't the original mission. And this is a part of my experience with, uh, you know, explicit lyrics. I had a mission. The original mission um, was a story about me and Action Love going to get revenge on a dude in the hood. And we kind of ran up on his crew, you know, open fire, this, that, and the third he wasn't there. We ran him down, chased him, found his girl, slapped her up, and <laughs> he came in the picture and then we caught him. So that was the original mission and the label shut that down. The label was like, we can't put this record out. And we like, wow, this shit is dope. <laughs> but they were like, you know, that's not the image we want to portray. And we want something that we can actually get played on the radio. So I had to respect that, right? And then I went back and rewrote a whole nother story, a whole nother mission. And um, that's where the mission part two became part one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so, so this album, you know, does, does well also. Now, uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner, who played Theo on The Cosby Show, which music videos was he directing during this time? Yeah, he directed The Magnificent and okay. Come On, Let's Move It. Aha. Both of those right. videos. Yeah, so he okay. had just got into, you know, directing, and um, he wanted to do some, some hip-hop videos. And I was like, yeah, that's a great look. Yeah, let, let, let him, you know, jump in. Okay, and he was on the Cosby show by this point. Yeah, he was big. He was a big star on TV. And he wanted to get, and I know he was directing some Cosby stuff. He was becoming more of a director. So he just wanted to venture over into hip hop due to his love of hip hop. And um, I was like, cool, let's get go for it. You know what I'm saying? Okay, and that relationship actually got you a cameo on the Cosby show, which at the time was the biggest show in the world. Yeah, Cosby show was super big. And um it it definitely helped. I don't I don't think that it was like a sure thing. I mean, we'd have to ask Malcolm if he had the juice like that. But we we got directed to the fact that they wanted a hip hop artist to play a little part, you know, like a cameo role. 
And um, I went down there and I had to do the reading. I had to go through the process. So it wasn't just like, oh, you know, jump in here. It was more so like, hey, there's an opportunity here. Why don't you see if, um, you know, you can get this role? And I actually got it. They, they you know, kind of was feeling me. And I went in and did that. And that was great. My guy, um, Chill, was in that episode with me. And um, Alan Payne is his name. He was he was in that with me. And it was pretty cool. 